Sandy in Johnstown, PA. I must be Pennsylvania, writes to me and he says, Hey Paul, why does Octave Records need all those channels for recording? Couldn't you just go directly from the microphone into the recorder in stereo? Well, <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, think back to the history of recording. I don't mean back when people were yelling into a horn. <laughs> That's pretty far back. No, I mean, in the 70s and 80s, there was a big push in audiophile recordings to do direct-to-disc. And this was tough stuff. I mean, really tough stuff. Doug Sachs, uh, Sheffield Records, gosh, what were some of the other ones? Um, oh, the names escape me now. But there, there was quite a few of them that specialized in that. Now let's think about what that actually means. So we've got a microphone, several microphones, multiple microphones, whatever we have, and a band, and all of that is being sent into an analog mixer and mixed just right, okay? That output from that analog mixer goes directly into a vinyl cutting machine. Now, for those of you that know about vinyl cutters, there is an art to it that is using microscopes that essentially you have to, uh, well, I, I'm doing this, but there's actually motors and things on it, but um, changing the, the, the cutting head to allow for large loud passages, because if you recorded everything as if it was a loud passage, you wouldn't have much room on the record. So on soft passages, we're changing the, the cutter to, uh, to be okay with that. And then on loud passages, where we want to have big groove movement, we change the cutter again. Now, when we take one of our Octave DSD recordings and go over and have a vinyl version made of it, that is done with some pretty cool stuff. And the way that works is we built a box, a digital box, that takes the digital signal that from the DSD recording and delays it just a smidge. I think it's maybe half a second, three quarter, I don't, I don't I, the engineers figured all that out, okay? And that, and then it goes through a D-to-A converter and then another D-to-A converter for the signal that is not delayed, okay? So how this works, it's just kind of cool. On the signal that is not delayed, that's going directly to the device that is adjusting the cutter, okay? So we know in advance by half a second, long enough for the cutter to make an adjustment and this is fairly standard practice. Our box is kind of unique, but this is kind of standard practice on how it's done. It says, oh, a big loud passage is coming. I'm going to make a change. And a little motor in there just goes and makes the change. Meanwhile, half a second later, that loud passage actually comes through and gets cut onto the vinyl. But imagine now a direct-to-disc recording as I described it with the band. Now all of a sudden, you've got an engineer sitting there, there's no delay, they didn't even have, it was all analog, and he's got a little wheel here, and he's following along in the script, and he knows when Lincoln Mayorka or whoever is making this recording, it's gonna get loud, <laughs> changes the cutting head, the loud passage happens, <laughs> comes back, and if he screws up, or the band screws up, lost to take. <laughs> I mean, wow, that was some good stuff. Today, we don't have to worry about all that. Yes, we could and will make some live recordings. In fact, on the 29th, I'm going to go to Temple Emanuel in Denver, and we're going to do a live recording of a giant pipe organ. And that ought to be really fun. And we'll mix it right on the fly. We won't have to do anything. And most of our recordings are live when, when, when I do them. Now, when we do a band, some of our other engineers are much more punch in, punch out, traditional, you know, 
30,000 tracks, whatever, and we, we can accommodate up to, the Pyramix system can do over 100. We're set up to do 40 right now with all of our A to D converters and all of that. We're set up for about 40. But we don't normally do that many tracks. So when I record, I'm, I'm sort of the purest recording guy here, the, that, that engineer, if you will. And mine are rarely more than 16 tracks. And most of them, well, for, for example, we just did Otis Taylor. And Otis, we're just starting with Otis. And so for Otis, I had three microphones on his guitar. One was a center mic, kind of close, a single mono mic. And a little bit farther back was a bloom line set up stereo microphone to capture the room and some of his playing. Now, I need to blend those two so it sounds natural. And then we had uh, a little bit of reverb on each one of those microphones. That's three more channels. So there you got six channels of live reverb and the microphone itself. And then we've got a bass player and then that's setting down the whole rhythm track. And then later on, they'll put headphones on and Otis will sing over it and we'll add drums and all that. So yeah, I mean, the way we make music definitely uses a lot of tracks. But the nice thing is there's no downside to it in that the way we mix, the way we do everything in DSD-256, we don't compromise quality at all, ever. So whether it's 30 tracks or two, we're going to get great sound out of it. Okay? All right. Thanks for the question. I'll talk to you later. Bye.